like we had mentioned in the previous unit, Americans typically have a favorable view towards science, right? Um, and if you look at some of the more popular pages, right, or if you look at social media trends as an inference for um, what people are looking for, um, millions of people follow science-related pages on Facebook. 26% of Facebook users follow science-related pages. 33% uh, consider Facebook as an important way to obtain news about science and, and stuff that's emerging and coming out. However, only 30% of pages that would be classified as a scientific page um, feature new scientific discoveries. 30%. It's, not, it's not, not even close to, to the majority. And only 12% are focused on explaining concepts. So a lot of people are using these for, you know, are following these pages. Um, a lot of them are using them as sources to obtain their information or a, an important way to obtain their, their, their knowledge of science. Um, however, 30% of them only 30% of these pages actually provide reports on new scientific discoveries, and only 12% actually explain concepts. So what people are actually even getting is, isn't really isn't really fulfilling their needs. And then we're not even factoring in that the people going to these pages, by and large, may not have a very high literacy. So may not even understanding that what they're getting isn't actually an explanation of science, isn't valid either as well. We'll get into that in a bit. Um, same thing we sort of see with healthcare. People are searching information for, you know, issues related to health. From the Pew uh, Data Research Foundation, 2016, again, 55% um, the past 12 months have looked online for, you know, a specific disease or a medical problem, medical treatment, food safety, how to lose weight, which is kind of my area of research and, and practice. Um, so people are looking online, you know, not only for science, but for information specific related to their health. And again, this is more data, again, from the Pew Research Center about what people are, are looking for. Again, it breaks down you know, this between, um, you know, um, age, uh, or sorry, between sex and education level. And it shows you, again, that, you know, we see it both in men and women, we see it in college graduates, we see it in high school graduates, um, that people are, are going online for their information. So we talked about, again, there's a gap. What's get, what gets out to the public isn't written for them. Okay, so where people are going to be turning to, right? So they don't have access to it from to the library. It's not written for them. Where are they turning to? Because people have a favorable view. People want to consume science. Maybe they don't have a super great understanding, um, but they're using it on, on Facebook, right? Like there's, these pages have millions of followers and millions of people follow these pages. So where are they going, right? And what are they getting? And what, what's actually happening when they get to these pages? Again, very few actually explain co these concepts and it's not a guarantee that even these things are explained um, accurately. If you look at um, the a large portion of the science that's shared on social media and the news media is exaggerated or outright inaccurate, flat out inaccurate. Haver et al. published a great paper in PLOS, which reviewed 50 of the most shared academic articles and media articles I think over the past, uh, over a year. 34% of studies reviewed use language that reviewers considered, and there was about, I think, 21 reviewers assessed each article. 34% of the studies re reviewed, or right, at least 50 articles, um, let me do this over here, um, the language is considered too strong given the, the you know, the um, strength of the causal inference, basically that they were overextending, or overextrapolating findings in the study. Okay, 34%. 48% um, use strongly language in their associated academic articles. So the articles are saying one thing, and then the report in the media article is, is different, right? And that's not accurate reporting in science. 58% of the media of articles inaccurate report the question, the results, the intervention, or population of the academic study. We see this all the time um, when you have uh, you know, a basic science report, like it's something done in a Petri dish or if, with a mouse, which is very useful information to build the next step of a line of inquiry. You'll see a lot of media agencies run with is that they'll, they'll, they won't mention this was studied actually in mice or the headline, which is what most people end up reading on social media. They don't read um, you know, the full thing, they just read the headline. And uh, that can be dangerous. So people think, you know, um, you know, maybe 
turmeric solved everything, right? Because of a study that you know examined it in a, a petri dish, right? Um, without realizing that you know you could drop water in a petri dish and it would kill kill most things, right? So um, again, if you don't have the the background knowledge to really dive into these findings, you're going to believe these things. And again, people are people are looking for these this information, and what they're getting isn't always valid. So why does this happen though? People say why why do like why do why does this happen? Why do the media agencies do this, right? So um, a little bit of bias, you know. I, I very critical of the media um, for for many many reasons. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a strong uh, Chomsky. Uh, supporter of his work. Um, I'd recommend most people read uh, his work, Manufacturing Consent, kind of dives into some of the, the, the theoretical basis for my the lens I view the media. Uh, but media media companies are heavily reliant on advertising for revenue. Um, and you know, incent- this incentivizes the production of potentially inaccurate health news that is not commensurate with the evidence to draw traffic at the expense of objectivity and journalistic re- um, integrity. And that's some of the references here that, that touch on this. Media outlets spin and encourage dissemination of catchy, overstated, inaccurate, or misleading headlines to gauge a larger, larger audience. Like it's, it's you know, it's uh, good for business for these companies to draw a bunch of attention, a bunch of buzz. And what you do that is you make hardline statements. You say, um, you know, beets cure heart disease or turmeric, you know, cures cancer, right? That's not as catchy, right? Like, I mean, that's way more catchy, right? These hardline statements and saying, well, in a mouse model, um, turmeric was found to reduce the, um, the growth of certain malignancies, right? Um, I mean, that's another thing we often see in the media that you'll, you'll say cures cancer. That, you know, you ask an, an immunologist or a cancer uh, researcher or an oncologist, um, they would, you know, realize that you know, cancer is... It's not a singular disease, even if in the same organ system. There's nothing that cures cancer because there's multiple different cancers, even of the same, you know, of the same organ system. So again, um, hardline statements draw viewers, right? Controversy draws viewers, and when you have more viewers, you can sell more ads and generate more revenue, more clicks. Um, and these companies are very wise to this. Remember, at the end of the day, and again, this is probably a little bit of bias on my end, and I'm going to acknowledge it, um, that you know, media agencies, especially privately held, which the majority of them are, are selling you. They're selling your viewership for advertisement. At the end of the day, if they're a privately held media agency, that is their job. Um, it's how they support themselves. It's through ad revenue. So they are selling you and your viewership. And whatever they can do to get more views, that's kind of kind of be kind of um, play the name of the game here, right? So just bear that in mind, and an understanding of that, which most people don't understand, um, makes you take pause with you know how things are reported. Just to bear that in mind. No, I I can't be super harsh on the media without acknowledging that you know scientists are not immune to this either, right? Or we call publishing misconduct. And for that, we're looking at retractions of papers and redactions of papers. So while the retraction rate was um, 1.8 papers per 10,000 in the year 2000, it has increased to about four papers per 10,000 in 2015, right? So 2000 to 2015 were almost a double the, the rate. So you know, the, that, you know, the you know, half of the retractions appear to have been involved in fa- fabrication, False, uh, falsification, plagiarism, or behaviors that fall within the U.S. government's kind of definition of scientific misconduct, right? Um, and again, we'll get into some some of the incentives for why this probably happens. Um, the good thing is, one of my great um, early mentors, my PhD program, and I've, I've, I've seen this myself, science, science is a contact sport, right? So typically something's super hard line. There was a paper that just came out in New England Journal of Medicine about the COVID pandemic um, using, it was basically, I don't know how this got published, but it was 53 um, subjects, small, relatively small, and no control group, and got, you know, the findings were published. Now, granted, we're in a, you know, a bit of a crisis situation, but the, the scientific rigor to make, um, was, was just not there to make the conclusions they were making. Um, so, you know, immediately people, you know, had responded. Um, you know, so, you know, a lot of papers get retracted, you know, these ones with this misconduct within the first year. Right? People find these things, um, you know, and 
and uh, you know retract these things earlier. They get like this is this is you know that. But there are some papers that that can make it through for a long time before they're eventually pulled for their misconduct. The other thing I want to mention, though, so even though the rate has doubled, right, since, you know, if we look between, you know, over time, it has stayed fairly stable since 2012 without super large increases here and there. Um, it's also important that the tumble number of scientific paper, papers has also more than doubled. So while the rate stayed about the same, we also have a lot more papers, so something to bear in mind. Um, and... Uh, Important, there, there are a handful of bad actors out there, right? So according to the data, there are about 24,000 authors involved in retraction of about um, you know, all these publications. And out of this number, 20,000 are one-time offenders. Um, there's about 4,000 have two to five retracted papers to their name. There are actually 367 authors that have like more than six. There was one um, author that had 166 retractions um, in terms of the, the max number. And I have a link to retraction watch on the bottom there. Um, so again, it's, it's, there are people who, like, that's all they do. They look for uh, science that is, you know, scientific misconduct and then, um, you know, and whether or not a paper was retracted. So again, science is a contact sport. If you put out stuff, um, you know, if you don't come correct, people will come, will come get you, right? Um, so we look at... Uh, maybe some of the contributions, right? So, um, you know, the leading nation, I mean, America does have quite a few, but the leading nation uh, for scientific misconduct, papers with retractions come from China. Um, a lot of this may have to do with how they incentivize publication in different countries, um, as we see that in influence in different areas, but the, the, the large portion um, come from, are coming from China, and we can see a lot of this has to do as, as their research productivity has increased, right, over the you know, past you know, couple decades, right, we have seen a spike um, as well in some of the, the misconduct um, in these, uh, you know, in, in, by these scientists there. Another little fun fact, you know, about 2% of scientific papers, 2%, um, it surveyed about 20,000 found scientific images that were deliberately manipulated. Um, just, you know, again, like it's, it's so even ranges from reports to even how the images were, were rendered. Um, you know, there were, you know, I think the, I even have colleagues say they've like found papers in different publications that literally use the same images of cells in completely two completely different experiments. Um, that two different, completely, completely different scientific reports. So it, it's, it, scientists are not immune to this as well. Um, and again, you know, um, we see distributions amongst different you know, countries, different uh, um, numbers of authors. We also see different distributions amongst journals, right? So while 54% of these journals are one-time offenders, journals like the Journal of Biochemistry have 253 retractions, about 13% of total retractions to the credit. PLOS One has 132 retractions. Um, we think... Um, you know, some of this has to do with, with some journals have, you know, they, they take a lot more publications. Um, we're also seeing a lot more predatory journals out there as well, which have like fake reviews. Um, but it can have, have big consequences. The Journal of Tumor Biology um, lost its impact factor because of the number of uh, falsifications uh, that were um, present. So again, this is the, you know, what we saw here, uh, the Journal of Biological Chemistry. Um, tumor biology, they, they no longer have an impact factor. There's going to be consequences. So the scientific committee does not, does not play around. Um, and then, again, we look at, like, where we see this in, right? There, usually the retractions, the max, these are top 20 journals with the maximum number of retractions. They're in big-time journals. Nature, Science, you know, PLOS, National Academies of Science, um, Journal uh, – yeah, sorry, I misspoke there. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Um, Anesthesia, um, you know, again, going that one guy had 166, cell, blood. These are big-time journals, right? You get in one of these journals that can make your career. Um, now, why does this happen? So scientific misconduct, misconduct is likely to more happen in countries that lack integrity policies, um, where publication performance is rewarded with cash. That does exist in some countries. I wish it existed here to some degree. We don't get paid for what we publish. And in cultures where situations where mutual criticism is hampered, 
right? And it, it typically happens in the, in the early parts of your career. That's why most American universities, especially R1 universities, it is required for you to go through scientific um, ethics, right? Because uh, if, you, if you learn bad habits about how to report your science, you're likely to be doing that in your career, right? Um, so, you know, the efforts reduce for misconduct, like, might be focusing on, you know, promoting integrity policies, mentoring, training, encouraging people to be transparent, right, to, to you know, to, to do things the right way. Now, and I do also want to acknowledge 40% of retraction notices are not due to fraud, right? It might just be due to the errors, problems of reproducibility, which, which can happen, but 60% are not due to that, right? So again, we, we see it primarily in countries where, you know, lack of research integrity policies, publications reward with cash, um, where mutual criticism is hampered, right? you don't speak up, um, you're silenced, and, you know, we're in the early phase of someone's career. Uh, and again, it's why it's so important that we focus on um, addressing this stuff early and teach people good habits. Because um, the problem is, the paper makes it out there. It's really hard. It's really hard to undo um, lies once they've taken, taken root in the collective mindset, um, right? The collective um, knowledge that society possesses. It's really hard to, to convince people otherwise. So this, this is a big part of it. Again, going back to like we mentioned, vacuums, right? That we've got situations where people have limited literacy or limited access to good information. It's not written for them. The questions aren't written for them. The papers aren't reviewed by them. And by and large, they're paying for it. They're looking for information. Social media, the media is where people get most of their information. It's kind of hard to get it in a clinic. Providers don't have time. They're not even resourced with it um, as well sometimes because of just the volume. Um, they've got a million other things to focus on. So people are going online. However, the news does not report it consistently accurate, may outright fabricate a story or completely misinterpret it um, or inaccurately report it. And then even the science sometimes that gets out there can be reported inaccurately. Right, so we've created a vacuum upon a vacuum. So what are the consequences of this? Well, um, I'll leave you with this, you know, uh, this here, right? So David Avocado Wolf, the, the food bit, babe, right? There are, there are consequences. You're, if you're fulfilling roles, and advice my dad gave me years ago, if, you're, if there's a role that you're supposed to be fulfilling and you're not, someone else will, and you might not like who they are, right? I um, mean, might not like who, what they have to say, right? Um, and again, people are looking, are hungry for this information, the public. They may not be able to, to tell, discern truth from falsehood. And they're, the only people that are actually speaking to them are people with, with a specific intent to exploit their lack of knowledge and their fears. And they are very good at this. The David Avocado wolves in the world who will share a bunch of like dog and cat pictures, lure people into a sense of security, and then on the back end, expose them to something completely farcical that people have established trust and likability in this person, um, and they can, that can be easily exploited. Food Babe will put out things that sound scientifically enough, but if you, you know, don't, you know, if you had a, if you had a science literacy, literate mind, you'd be able to eviscerate some of the things that are put out there. Most people don't have that. And for, for many years, and we're getting better at this now, we'll talk about things that we can do, um, there hasn't been a discerning voice. So at the end of the day, people you know, will always make their decisions for themselves, right? but there are social forces and invisible forces that we can um, at least play into to give people the opportunity, the opportunity to make an informed decision. And that's really, I think, the emphasis here. Um, so, you know, I love this quote here. It's from the Physiological Society, you know, in, in, um, based in England. It came out in 2017. In an era of alternate facts, it is our responsibility that true scientifically evidenced message, the true scientifically evidenced message is made public rather than allowing rampant myths to be propagated and not challenged by those with access to the wider public, who are, in the end, our target audience. We are in a privileged position whereby a lot of our research can and does have a direct application pipelines, and as such should reach the end user directly from us. It should be, should be from the horse's mouth directly to the public. Meet people where they are going. 
and when they're going, as we'll see in the next unit, is increasingly online. So with that, again, I, I hope you guys have a, have a bigger un, or better understanding of the scope and the contributors to this problem, and this will help kind of guide what we can do to solve this problem. And we'll get into some social media trends in a bit.